can be the ones that God uses to make the difference for Jesus Christ. Now, we don't want to make a difference for politics. We don't want to make a difference for the nation. We want to make a difference for people's eternity. We want people to be saved. We want people to be sanctified. And you know what? When we do that, other things will start to fall into place. If, if, you know, if, if we want America to be saved, we need to get Americans saved. And you know what's going to make a difference in the politics? If politicians get saved. You know what's going to make a difference in our government? If government officials get saved. You know what's going to make a difference in this new year? If more people get saved. So what do we need to be doing? We need to be planning. We need to be watering. We need to let God get the increase in our life. That way people can be saved. That's what's going to make the difference. So as we, as we head through this year, 2022, 2021 is behind us. 2022 is ahead of us as we try and live out our day-to-day -day lives. If we'll serve the Lord, He can have the increase. Now we've got a couple announcements for you here this morning. January 15th, we're going to have a work day. What better way to start out the new year than to get some cleaning done? We've got some things that need to be done around the church and some perspective things, Lord willing, that will uh, be happening here pretty soon. So if you will, join us January 15th at 10 a.m. to get some work done around the church. Probably be inside uh, unless it, it continues to be 70 degrees uh, in January, then we may do some things outside. But if you will, join us. And we'll actually, uh, my wife and I are talking, trying to get together maybe a little bit earlier that morning to get a breakfast ready for you. And uh, so maybe we might have something going on about 9 o'clock, have some breakfast, and then we'll get to work. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, because after I eat, I always get tired. But <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we're looking forward to that. And of course, we've, we still are continuing. Now, we weren't able to do it Friday because it rained. We're still continuing our sign holding. Uh, down at the square on Friday evenings from 4.30 to 5.30. That's been a great success. We've had many people come. And you know what? We're not, we're not out there. We don't have a, a, a sign with, with my name on it, and you don't have a sign with your name on it. We've got a sign that says something about Jesus. We've got one big sign that says, Jesus saves. He's the only one that does. And we've got a little thing down there at the bottom that says Grace Baptist Church that people know where we assemble together at, where they can meet with like-minded Christians and uh, we want to make sure that people know that Jesus is the reason for everything in this world. He holds it all together by the word of his power. And uh, just exciting to be able to go down there, have fellow laborers with me, and uh, just getting the word out to Gilmer County about the Lord and about his salvation and about the, the coming judgment upon sinners. We want people to know that there's a Savior, but if you don't receive him now, there will be a coming judgment. We want to warn people and let them know. And of course, we're going out every Monday night. At 5 p.m., door-to-door -door visitation. we got several people coming with us doing that, just knocking on people's door. We invite them to church. We tell them about Grace Baptist, a little bit about the things that are going on here. But the most important thing that we do is we tell them that Jesus saves. So we've got the same message wherever we go. We're doing the same thing with whatever endeavor that we're doing. Our ultimate goal is that people are saved. That's what God wants. God says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we've got those things going on indefinitely, of course. So every Monday night at 5 p.m., if you'd like to come with this visitation, please come. Every Friday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. at the square, if you'd like to come with us, please. It's easy. All you're doing is you're holding a sign with some letters on it, and it doesn't say... Uh, free cash now. It doesn't say, get your title upon here. It says, Jesus saves. It says a Bible verse. It says something about the Lord. All you got to do, and if you don't want people to see you, just hold it above your face, right there. <laughs> so, it, it's super easy. Great time of fellowship. And uh, if, if you ever happen to be going around the square and you see us holding a sign, what you'll see is, I'll be holding a sign, and a brother or a sister will be right here, and we'll just be over here yakking. And we might, oh, yeah. And we'll just keep, it's a great time of fellowship. And of course, in, as we're doing door-to-door -door visitation, if we're walking, we're, we're talking. If we're, if we're riding in the vehicle, we're having a good time. If you want to know how to get to know somebody at Grace Baptist Church, just come and join us as we try to tell more people about Jesus. That's the best way to fellowship one with another. Now, if you notice, I've mentioned this several times, but I, and I'm going to continue doing this. We are no longer having, no longer having the 6 p, or 1:30 uh, p.m. service for the time being. So, no turnaround service. We're going back to the regular 6 p.m. schedule on Sunday evening. So, if you're going to be here for evening service, it'll be at 6 p.m. It will be tonight. Tonight, we're going to go over Galatians chapter 6. That will be the last chapter 
in the book of Galatians. So exciting. Looking forward to that and see what God has to have for us in that chapter. Uh, but again, we're not having the turnaround services. Now, as far as meals go, I know during the turnaround service we had meals together. Uh, this upcoming third Sunday, January 16th, we will be having a fellowship meal after the morning service. So keep that in mind. We won't have a p.m. service uh, that third Sunday, but we will be having a fellowship meal after the morning service. Now, more exciting than all of those things that I just mentioned, ex with the exception of being a witness for Jesus Christ, we've got a missions conference coming up in February, the very first Sunday week of February. So February 6th through the 9th. We've got two excellent preachers coming to present the ministry of missions, and uh, so excited about that. Both of these men are former missionaries themselves, and they're going to present to us the, the responsibility that the church has to missions worldwide, our individual responsibility to be supporters of the work of the gospel going abroad. The Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. What an important command to fulfill that people hear that Jesus saves, not just here in Gilmer County, not just down at the square, not just when we knock on somebody's door, but they're all across the world. People need to be saved, and uh, we want to make sure that gospel call goes out everywhere, and they're going to tell us more about how we can do that, how we can be involved, and what, again, the responsibility that falls upon us as a local church to make sure that we are supporting missions. And we'll be having, after the morning service that Sunday, February 6th, we'll be having a fellowship meal. And then, of course, we'll have Sunday school, we'll have Sunday morning service, and we'll have that fellowship meal, we'll have Sunday evening service. And then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., so that's February 7th, 8th, and 9th, we will be having a, uh, another service at 6.30 with the preaching. But before that, at 5 p.m., we're going to have a meal every day. So uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 5 p.m., we'll be having a fellowship meal. There, we'll have missionaries presenting every night. So if you come in for this fellowship meal, you'll be able to talk to them. You'll be able to speak to them. You'll be able to get to know these missionaries uh, that, are, that are going out and giving the gospel to all the world. I mean, they've got some very exciting conversations. Now, just imagine, they, they haven't necessarily been to the field yet, but they've been to a bunch of churches. They probably can tell you some crazy stuff <laughs> uh, as they go from church to church. So it's exciting uh, if you want to come for that. And, of course, we'll have that regular service at 6.30 p.m. We'll have Pastor Brent Logan preaching to us. Uh, introducing to us Faith Promise Missions. And again, like I said, there may be many of you here that are familiar with that program, but I asked him uh, to pretend like all of us have never heard of it before. We'll start from scratch, and, and he'll be presenting that to us as a church. I'm looking so forward to that. Please be praying for that meeting coming up. Um, we've, of course, still got several people that we need to be praying for in Grace Baptist. If you will, please be praying for Miss Teresa Hinkle this morning. Of course, Brother Phil is usually here, um, but he wasn't able to come this morning. Be praying for uh, Miss Teresa. She just had a high heart rate, and uh, Brother Phil did not want to leave her uh, by herself. So if you could, just be praying for her. And of course, you know the cancer situation uh, and everything that is involved in that treatments and otherwise. So just remember her. I want to remember Brother Yul Reese still in hospice care. I remember Miss Sherry Walls, of course, with everything that's going on in her life. And we've got several uh, that are sick. We want to remember Brother Fred and Miss Kathy. They're not here this morning because they still are quarantining themselves after a possible exposure to COVID. So we appreciate them doing that. And uh, so if you could pray for them. And I believe, as far as I know, that's, that's it for the moment. We do have a birthday uh, today. I'd not like to mention Miss Dorothy Lively. It's her birthday. Well, it's not today. It's actually on the 4th, I believe. Let me double check that before I... Yes, on the 4th, Miss Dorothy Lyle, I don't believe she's here this morning, uh, but if you, if, you, if you see her, if you if you got her number, make sure you text her, let her know, happy birthday, and uh, I believe that's it. I'll pray, and Brother Terry can come minister the music. Father, we come before you now in Jesus' name. We thank you so much for your love and for your mercy. I pray, God, this morning that you'd have your will and way in our hearts and lives, and Lord, that you'd use me. I pray, God, you'd unctionize me, that you'd fill me with your spirit, Lord, that you could speak through me, Lord, to your people. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all get our songbooks to turn to page number 34. Let's all stand and sing, Praise Him, Praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, sing all earth His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangel in glory, strength and honor give to His holy name. 
Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrow, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Him crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious power and glory unto the Lord prolong praise him praise him his excellent greatness praise him praise him ever in joyful song. Thank you. Maybe sing it. <clears throat> okay, this time we're going to have Sister Rita come and worship and song with us. Y'all worship her as she sings. <clears throat> Y'all bear with me. It's been a while since I've done this. <laughs> so pray for me. I can do it. Don't have the lung capacity I had since I had COVID. I found that out. So um, if I make a sour note, just laugh. <laughs> I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world below there's no sickness no toll or danger in that bright land to which I go I'm going there to see my father and all my love ones who've gone home. I'm just going over Jordan. I'm just going over home. I know dark clouds will gather round me. I know my way is hard and steep, yet beauteous feel. 
arise before me where God's redeemed their vigils keep I'm going there to see my mother she said she'd I'm just going over Jordan I'm just going over home I'm just going over home Hey man, that was a that was a blessing, especially after what y'all had to listen to on Wednesday night. Praise God, that was very good, Miss Rita. Thank you for that. Praise the Lord. Well, as I mentioned already, it's a new year, and uh, I don't have a New Year's message. I hope that's okay. I, I got a Bible message, Lord willing, that'll that'll be what we look at this morning. But if you will turn your Bibles to First Corinthians chapter three, that's where we've been. These last several weeks, several, several weeks, been in 1 Corinthians, and we've made our, our way all the way to chapter 3 and verse 8, so we're not, we're not trying to travel quickly, um, but we want to do, uh, do justice to God's Word. We want to make sure that we bring out what God wants us to have in His Word. We'll pray, and then we'll get into the message. Father, we thank You this morning for Your goodness and mercy. Thank You, Lord, for the reminder that we are. We're just pilgrims passing through. We're wayfaring strangers, Lord. We're, we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And we're, we're, Lord, we have an expectation. We, we have the blessed hope of the return of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking for it. We're abiding in Him. Lord, we want to see you come as quickly as possible. But Lord, in the meantime, help us to be laborers together with you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, we spoke about where our allegiance should lie. And we saw in the Corinthian church that men and women, I'm sure alike, have decided that their, their allegiance would be to a man or to a minister. And, and so easily do we fall into that same snare where we look to someone's eloquence, we look to someone's ability, we look to someone's past achievements, and we start to put all our stock in them. But the Bible is clear. And verse 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, Paul is speaking, I have planted Apollo's water. Yes, they're laborers, but look at what the end of the verse says, but God gave the increase. We were able, after careful consideration of what the Scriptures had to say, to conclude that man is nothing. We don't bring anything to the table to help God. God doesn't need anything from us. Just like He said in Acts chapter 17, He said, by Him we live and move and have our being. He, he doesn't ascribe anything to us or from us. He doesn't need us whatsoever. It doesn't matter the intellect. It doesn't matter the zeal. It doesn't matter the understanding. It doesn't even matter the passionate desire a man may have to serve God. He cannot do anything apart from God. Remember, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 22 that the Scripture hath concluded all under sin. We find ourselves impure. We find ourselves unable. We're failures. We are fallible. There are mistakes. There are times when we miss the mark. The Bible says that all of us, each and every one of us, have a heart that is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So if we're going to look to anyone... It shouldn't be a Paul. It shouldn't be Apollos. We should be looking to the Lord. We should be like the psalmist who said, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. If anyone is going to give us some help, it would be the one that created the very foundation which we stand upon, would it not? If anyone's going to be able to help us, it would be the one who gave life into us, making us a living soul, would it not? Who is Paul? Who is Apollos when you have God? 
Why would you want to look to anyone else other than the Lord Jesus Christ? See, these men, they are simply ministers of the increase of God. And as I've read already, I'll read again in verse 6. says, I have planted Apollos watered, but God, but God gave the increase. See, in verse 7, it gets more specific. In verse 7, the Bible says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So the planter, he's nothing. And in fact, the planter, the, the supply which he is using is given by the Lord. He's not using his own seed. He's not using his own supply. It's the Lord's seed which he is planting. And the waterer, well, he's not using anything that he brought to the table, and he's not anything himself. He's using the water which the Lord had supplied to take care of tending the crops. Neither laborer is bringing anything of themselves, nothing of their own substance, and neither laborer can take credit for the increase of the field. If it weren't for the seeds of the master, if it weren't for the water of the master, their effort would have amounted to nothing. That's why it says, the planter, he's nothing. The waterer, he's nothing. Now imagine this. Imagine a man who goes out into a barren field. And for lack of seed, he can do nothing. He, he, he doesn't have any seed to bring, but he goes out and he tries the very best that he can, and he knows the motions that he's supposed to make to scatter seed. And he's out there, and, and he's doing this. And he's he, doing this. He's not, now he's not got no seed. He's not got anything. But he's doing all the motions that are, are necessary. And then you've got a man, and he's, he's, he's a waterer, but he has no water of his own, and he comes out to the field, and he brings his empty pot, and he, he intimates what it would look like for him to diligently take care of the substance. And, and he, 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 each row he'd go down, and he's, but there'd be no water. Now, wouldn't that be a silly thing to see? And we see that the carnality of these Corinthians is manifested in the fact that they kept dividing over men's ministry. Because you know what men's ministry amounts to is what I just showed you. Because without God, they're nothing. Without God, they're simply sweating. Without God, they're simply toiling. Without God, they're simply fatiguing themselves. There's, there's no ability in themselves to make the crop grow or plant the seed or water without God. Now, wouldn't it be a funny thing for us to say, well, didn't you see Paul out there scattering the seed? And did you see how he took his hands and he moved them like this? And did you see how he, he bent and he planted the seed? And, and the way that he did that was just so much better than how Apollos took. It's so boring. He just got the water bucket and he tipped it over. And I mean, he just did this. And, and you know, Paul moves around a whole lot more. He's more exciting. And so they start looking to Paul. And then the other people say, well, I really like how Apollos waters. He, he just kind of stays on one subject. He just kind of, he's right here and he, I can follow what he's doing. And he's not moving around all over the place. He's just kind of... Little by little. And he's, just, he's way better than that crazy Paul guy. I can actually follow what he's trying to give out. But both of these people are nothing. Because all they are are laborers. All they are are the ones who are in the field administering what God has given to each of them. You know, our Christian identity cannot have a hyphen. I mentioned this last week. We can't be of the Paul crowd. We can't, we can't be of the Apollos crowd. You won't believe this. We can't be a part of the Baptist crowd. We've got to be God's people. We've got to have our allegiance to the Lord. And, and who is Apollos? Who is Paul? But they're nobody without the grace of God. Remember, they're headed straight to hell without forgiveness of their sin. They're just ministers. Ministers contribute nothing but participation. The best thing that a, that a minister can get, and not, don't, don't get me wrong, it's not a bad thing, but is a participation award. Because they didn't bring anything to the table. So why would we set our focus upon those men which have been set before us as ministers? And let's not forget, as we look through the Scriptures here, 
as these Corinthians divide over which man they think is the greatest, as they divide over who, who they think is the best minister of seed or the best waterer, they, let's not forget that they themselves are called to be ministers. They've forgotten that. They've allowed themselves to be detached from that aspect altogether. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18, the Bible says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. So if you're saved this morning, the verse right before that says, We're new creatures. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you're saved, the Bible goes on to say in verse 18, And hath given to us, who? Every person that's been saved, the ministry of reconciliation. So we're all responsible. These Corinthians, each one who is, who's talking about how much they love this person more than that person, they're personally responsible to be ministering themselves. You know, as saved, born-again believers, we have received the ministry of reconciliation. The Bible says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. It doesn't say, Go them. It says, Go ye. And, you know, like the Corinthians... You and I, it's easy to get excited about someone else's work. And it's, and it's easy to look to someone else's ministry and, and fawn over it and, and, and drool over what they're able to do and, and, and what God has, has used them in because we're just spectators. And if you're spectating, you've got plenty of time to observe someone else. And it's a whole lot easier to be an observer than to obligate yourself to the work. And also, just like the Corinthians, it's effortless to judge someone else's labor when you exclude yourself from the equation. It's, it's easy to point out the mode in someone else's eye if you forget that there's a beam in your own. And it's easier to be a criticizer than a cultivator. But when we become partially involved in the work, our perspective tends to shift a little. Our understanding grows. We come to understand that this is no game. It's not a spectator sport. It's not a, a criticizing little situation where you can just pick and choose and do that. It's something that we're all responsible for, and it's strenuous labor. Think about what Paul has, has intimated to us so far. In verse 7, he says, no, Neither is he that planteth. And then he says, Neither he that watereth anything. But in verse 8, it says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth. Now notice in this entire passage of Scripture that Paul is using an agricultural illustration. And he's using it to describe the ministry that we've all been given. Now I've never worked on a farm, and, and I, I don't necessarily have a desire to work on a farm, but I've, I've seen it from afar, and I've, and I've, I've heard tell it's pretty hard work. Pretty difficult labor. Pretty, pretty tough things to do. Not, not just you know, the big things, but just maintaining what you have. The, the feeding and the watering and then just the corralling of the animals and the, the picking up after them and the cleaning and the washings and all the things. Just the very bare minimum thing is hard work. Hard work. And it takes a lot more than just one person to get it done. It takes a whole lot more than just a few people. It takes a lot of people to run a farm. And Paul uses this illustration of farming, of agriculture, to tell us the work of the ministry is not easy. The work of the ministry is not for the faint-hearted. The work of the ministry is not for the lazy. It involves a lot of work. Now look at verse 8 with me. It says, Now he that planteth, and he that watereth. There are two individuals here that are identified. They're individual laborers. They have different occupations. They aren't doing all the same thing. It requires different gifts to plant than it does to water. It requires different abilities to water than it does to plant. You've used different muscles. You do different things. You go out at different times during the day. It takes different knowledge. One person's a planter and one person is a waterer. Did you know that you and I, as saved, born-again believers, we're called to the ministry? And whether we plant, whether we water, 
We're not all called to do the same thing, but we're all called to do something. We're all supposed to be involved some way, somehow, in the ministry that God has given to us. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 and 12, the Bible says, And He gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, you may be here this morning and you're not a preacher, and you're not a Sunday school teacher, and you're not very well versed in the scriptures because maybe your education is different from others, or, or maybe you just aren't that acquainted with the Bible itself. Maybe you are very well skilled in other areas. You know what you can do? You can be used in those. There's, there's probably some of you in here that can pray, that can just pray. And you can get answers from God. And you know what? That's your part of the ministry. You know, there's some people in here this morning that they can preach. That's good. And there's some people that can teach. Hey, that's good. And those are the ones that always get the spotlight shined on them because, well, here I am this morning. I'm standing in front of you. But those people that were praying this morning, you don't, you don't see their work. You don't see what they did. But guess what? If they were praying for God to be glorified, they have just as much part in what I'm doing right now as I do while I'm preaching to you. And do you know there's, there's some people in here that have just the gift of help. They come and they help. No matter what's going on at the church, no matter what's going on in the ministry, no matter what's going on in another brother or sister's life, they just want to help. And that's how they contribute. They're individual laborers. And they're willing to be used where God has given them Ability. Maybe, maybe it's just holding the gospel sign. Maybe it's going on visitation. Maybe, maybe you just need to memorize some scripture and hide God's word in your heart and, and be free from sin in your own life. That way you can be a testimony to someone else. I tell you what, there's some people here that can help in the nursery. And it is a blessing. It really is. Because you start hearing them little ones scream and cry and you think you're distracted. I'm really distracted. So, so it, it is such a blessing to know that there are people out there that can perform that work of the ministry. There's individual laborers, and God, God has used people around here to fix picnic tables. And you know what? That has contributed to the ministry of reconciliation. Imagine that. Fixing pieces of wood and putting them together so people can sit on them what about one day somebody's out there and they want to know about Jesus Christ? And, and here's a picnic table and here's a brother that knows the Lord and they get to sit down on that nice picnic table out there and they get saved. Guess who had part in that salvation? Whoever made that picnic table out there. We all are individual laborers and we all have been called to do something for the Lord. But, but get this. It says in verse 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. They're one. They're only one. So that indicates to us that there's got to be cooperation with other people to see people saved. You know, there's, there, there are some, some Christians, I believe they're saved, they're Christians. There's some saved people out there that they think that the salvation of the world depends on their effectiveness in their preaching. And they think they do it all by themselves, and I don't need your help, and I don't want your help, and no, I've got this, and, and I'm God's man, and God's going to use me because, well, I mean, have you seen me lately? But that's not what the Bible says. See, if we, if we look at the Baptist faith or the Methodist faith or the whatever faith, we get away from Bible faith. And we need to be concerned about what the Bible says. And the Bible says, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. That means that we've got to, though we're individual laborers, we've got to come together and be cooperative in order to get anything done. Whether it's planting or whether it's watering, there's a lot of ground to cover. Just here in L.A.J. Just here in Gilmer County, there's, there's a lot of people here. You wouldn't believe it. There are a lot of people here, my age and younger, never even had a Bible. 
And you think, how could that be? But I'm telling you, and if you've read that article that Brother John Jennings has talked about this morning, you'd believe me. People don't even know who Jesus is. They literally think that Jesus is a cuss word. That's all they know about Him. And there's a lot to get done. So what are we called to do? God's called me to preach. God's called me to teach. So I've got to be effective in that ministry. I've got to be willing to do that. But what? I've got to cooperate with my brothers and my sisters in Christ in order to get anything done. I can't do it by myself. Because guess what? It's a two-fold ministry. You've got to have a planter and a waterer. It's not just a one-man ministry. It's not just a one-person ideology. We've got to work together because we are one. And the planter and the waterer are one in the sense that they are working the same field with the same goal. We have a desire. If, if, you're, if you're a farmer and, and, and you've got some laborers with you and you're all doing your part, you're planting the seed, you're watering it, and you're tending to it every day, what are you looking forward to? The harvest. You want the harvest to come. You're, you all are individual laborers, but you're looking towards the same goal. You want the harvest to come. Well, as Christians, we want the harvest of souls to be reaped that people get saved. We're all working towards the same goal. And don't you see how detrimental it is for these Corinthians to faction off one against another? Because guess what? If the laborers aren't coming together, then guess who's not getting the increase? God. God's not getting the increase. So there's no place for factions because one cannot be effective without the other. Now go, the Bible goes on to say in verse 8, And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, you may like this, you may not, I don't know. But God isn't a communist. I don't know if you knew that or not. There's no collective payout. There's no just one lump sum given and it's all divided equally to make sure that everybody feels they've got their fair share. There's individual accountability with God. Yes, there's, there's laborers that are one, but God said the reward is going to be individual. And God's going to be looking at how you are laboring in the field of your life and He's going to reward you accordingly. Each individual's effort is going to be examined and rewarded. We are all, individual, uh, we are all individually responsible for cultivating the ground that the Lord has allotted us. Now, here, here's a good thing. Look at what it says in the last part of verse 8. It says, And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own increase. No. According to his own success? No. According to his own harvest? No. It says, Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Guess what? If you're a planter, and God's called you to plant, and you aren't one of these people that's too good to work with anybody else, and you're not one of these people that think you're you know, holier than thou, or that you're God's gift to the world, and you're planting and the waterer never shows up, that's not your fault. That's not on you. That's not your problem. If you've been called to plant, you plant. And you do what you're supposed to do. And guess what? God said, He's going to reward you for the labor. He's not going to reward you for the increase. And if you're a waterer, and you haven't run off every planter that you've ever come across because you think that waterers are the only ones that got it right, if you're a waterer and you say, you know what, I'm just waiting for a planter to come along so I can help him in the ministry, and he never shows up, you know what God said? Just, just get that bucket and you just water. Because the only thing that you're accountable for is watering. And if the planter never shows up, or if the planter is over here on the planting side of the church and the waterers are over here on the watering side of the church, and you're in the middle of trying to do something for God, you just do something for God. And He said He'll reward you according to your labor. So, who gets the increase? God does. But God is not going to dictate to us our reward based upon what the end result is. He wants us to labor. He wants us to labor. You know what God says to, to men and women who do good in their life? He says, well done thou good and 
faithful servant. doesn't say anything about success. He wants us to be faithful in what God has called us to do. Again, if you're a planter and the waterer doesn't show up, not your problem. You just keep on planting. If you're a waterer and the planter never shows up, not your problem. You just keep on watering. You keep doing what you're doing. And God will be pleased with what you're doing. As long as you're not running people off that are trying to help you, God says, you're going to get a reward. But here's the thing. The reward is for the labor, not the increase. But if God, if God is ever going to get the increase, we will have to cooperate. Let's read verse 9. For we are laborers together. We are laborers together. We are supposed to be doing what God has called us to do. We're supposed to be in the place that God wants us to be in. We're supposed to assemble ourselves together for the edification and for the exhortation of the Word. And when we do that, regardless of who else wants to be involved, that's not on us, but God says, if I'm ever going to get anything done, you guys have got to come together and stop splitting over dumb stuff. For we are laborers together. God gives the increase, but He has designed the process whereby the increase appears to be dependent upon the participation of both the planter and the waterer. Now, have you ever wondered, and I, I, I spoke uh, with Miss Judy about this the other day, have you ever wondered why we don't see the big revivals like we used to? You ever wondered why those crusades that Mr. Billy Graham did, did an excellent job, and a lot of people got saved, praise God, thank God for that. You ever wondered why 2021 never saw any of that? It's because there were some people planning over here. And over here, there were some people watering but they would never get over whatever was in between them and do it together. And they forgot that we're laborers together. You know, there can be no division because God is not going to be giving the increase without one of us and the other getting together and doing the work of God. You know, God designed the conception of a child to occur with only, within only a certain set of parameters. And no other way can life be conceived. And, and in the same way, God has confined His increase of His church to occur within certain parameters. And only in that one way will the increase appear. And if you're wondering why it seems like the church is dying, it's your fault. It's my fault. It's because we're not laboring together. We're not serving God together. I'm planting. You've got to come beside me and water. And while you're watering, I can't sit in my chair and eat a donut and, and not plant. I've got to plant. And you've got to water. And we've got to do it together. And that's how God is going to get the increase. You know, there's something interesting. God never says anything in this passage about how big the church has got to be. He never says anything about what the age category has to be. He never says anything about if anybody's got any physical limitations or if anybody has some educational things where maybe they've been stunted. It doesn't say anything about if there's somebody really super smart or, or they're intellectual. It doesn't say anything about people being enthusiastic. It just says there's got to be a planner and there's got to be a waterer. And when these two people come together in unison for the work of the ministry, God will give the increase. That's the solution. That, that's, how do we see the church grow? Not, you know what? God's not so much interested in, in, in numerical growth. God's interested in spiritual growth. He's interested in you personally growing as a Christian. He's interested in you personally developing holiness in your life. He wants you to grow. He wants to plow you as His field. He wants you to become a better Christian. You need a planter. You need a waterer. And you may be thinking to yourself, can such a thing occur in 2022? Would it even be possible? 
I mean, imagine the expense that would be associated with trying to get a big arena set aside for preaching of God's Word. And imagine who would even show up. Why, why would anybody even take two seconds to consider some tent revival on the side of the road? Well, God said if there's a planter and there's a water, He'll give the increase. So we're not responsible for the end result God is. Hey, that takes a load off of my back. I'm just supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing in cooperation with other believers. And guess what? Can it be done again? Well, it can. You know, there's 12 men that God used, they were apostles. And they were in cooperation one with another. Now, I'm not talking about Judas. We can talk about Matthias was voted in as the 12th apostle in replacement of Judas. But these, these 12 apostles went about in cooperation one with another. There were some waterers. There were some planters. Uh, they did whatever they needed to do that was necessary for God to get the increase. And guess what? God's still getting increased off of their ministry today. Is it possible for it to happen in your life? Absolutely. Turn with me real quickly to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Yeah, those were the apostles. Those were the apostles. What about other people? Acts chapter 17. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 1, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Where, there was, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Look what he's doing. He's planting. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Verse 4. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Even the women got saved. Praise God. Verse 5, But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out, of, out to the people. Now this is the testimony of the world. This is the testimony of people who are not saved. These are, this is a testimony of the people who wanted to get these people out of here. These are just Christians. This man named Jason is just trying to get people saved. There's just planting and watering occurring at the same time, and God's giving the increase. You know what the Bible says about these normal, average old folks? Verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. You know, if we'll get together, now, we're not ecumenical. We're basing everything on the Bible. I, I, I'm Bible this, and I'm, I'm Bible that, and if it's not in the Bible, I don't, I don't really care for it. So we we're, we're, we're want to make sure our fellowship is around the Word of God. But as long as it's around the Word of God, if we'll get together, you know what we can do? We can turn this world upside down. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. How do I know that? Because it's the testimony of Scripture. Because we've got God's Word on it. The Bible says, verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, two individual laborers coming together, working to the same end. Look what God does. But God gave the increase. And verse 9, the Bible says, For we are laborers together. But you know, that's not just the best part. Because we can labor together all day long and maybe not accomplish as much as we thought we would. But we're not doing it by ourselves. The Bible says that we are laborers together with God. With God. Could you imagine, as Paul is planting, he's about to run out of seed. And he's thinking, I've got to go back and grab another bag. That's going to keep me from planting right here. And, and he's, he's, he's got just a couple of grains left, and he, and he plants them real quick, and he thinks, I've got to run back. Oh, and there's God with another, another set of seed for him to use. And, and God is with him as he's planting. And here's Apollos, and he's watering, and his bucket's almost out. 
And he's thinking, I've got to travel a football yard's length all the way back over and get more water, and it's going to take a lot of time for me to do that. And, and as soon as he runs out, he turns around to go get some water, and there, look, there's God with all the supply that he could ever need. And God is laboring to get the increase with the laborers. If you've ever worked in a factory, if you've ever worked in the close proximity of a supervisor or a boss, how many times have you seen the boss kind of taking it easy while you're doing all the grunt work? I'm not, I'm not saying if you're the boss, that's, that's fine. Praise the Lord. But how many times have you seen the supervisor go up in the office where the air conditioning is and take a nap while you're out there grinding it out? But God doesn't do that. God's right down there with you, no air conditioning, no lunch breaks. You know what? He doesn't even sleep. God's always laboring. In fact, you know the labor that we're doing? It says we're laboring with God. This is God's work. God's been doing it before you was saved. And He don't need you, but He desires to use you that He can get the increase. And if you'll get down there and labor together, God says, I'll be right there with you. You know, the Bible says, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 18, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, Jesus says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We're laborers together. Let's get together. With God. And God will get the increase. Now, I hate, I hate to say this, but every true laborer has God working with him. And because of that, success is certain. I don't hate to say that. I'm glad that. If we're, if we're doing what God has prescribed, God said he will give the increase. Praise the Lord. But more often than not, the planter or the waterer or both delay or even completely stop or halt the work of God because of their own unfaithfulness or because of the vision that's entered in. You know, the trouble has never been with the harvest. The harvest has never been the problem because God will give the increase. The trouble's always been with the laborers. God's always been faithful. And He can't lie. And He abideth ever. And he's going to minister. But what about you? Can he use you? Better than that, can he use you in cooperation with someone else? God's trouble is not with the world. We think it is. We look at the political sphere and we look at the, uh, well, I don't know. Everything's crazy nowadays. You can name all things. We think, well, that's the, that's the reason that we're in such a big mess. No, it's not. The reason that we're in such a big mess is because we're not doing what God told us to do as Christians. His trouble's not with sinners because they just need to be saved. His trouble is with the saints who are slacking. Anywhere God can get Christians to labor and cooperate, He can get the increase. You know, and I hate to use this illustration, I really do. But it's so, it's so true. There's a group of people, and the Bible, the Bible, not me, this is not a slur, the Bible calls them sodomites. That's what the Bible calls them. And these people can't reproduce after their own kind. You know what they have to do? They have to recruit. They have to go out, and they have to introduce people to their lifestyle and draw them in through those means. And guess what? God's not in that. He's not given the increase with that. But look at the success that they have. Look at how much they're flourishing with their endeavor. What a sad testimony to know that God says if we'll plant water together, He'll give the increase and look at the state of the church. Look at the state of the nation. Look at the state of the world. And you go around and you start talking to people about Jesus Christ, and, you know, you used to, about 10 years ago, 
People say, oh, yeah, I'm saved, you know. And they kind of just blow you off. But now it's a, I don't want that, I don't need that. I don't have nothing to do with that. Well, who's the saved person in that scenario? Me. You. And why wasn't that person saved a whole long time ago? Because you was at the house, it was movie night, and there was a Netflix show you really liked. And instead of going out and telling somebody about Jesus, you thought, well, I don't need to do any planting tonight. And when a waterer came and, and said, hey, I'm going to go out here and water, will you plant with me? He said, no, well, I, I've got other things to do. I've got other operations that are in need of my help right now. And they said, well, but this is, God says if, if we do this together, he'll give the increase. I, I know, but I'll do it tomorrow. And you look around and you wonder how we got, that's how we got here. That's how it happened. So what's going to make the difference in 2022? Well, it'll be you and me working together so that God can get the increase. You know, Satan's greatest scheme is keeping the planter and the waterer from laboring together. Because there's only one way that God gets the increase, and it's through that. Now, if you, if you ever walk into the office back there, you'll see this. My, my mother-in-law painted this on the wall for me, and I do appreciate it. It's a constant reminder. But the last verse in the book of Colossians says this. Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Verse 9, the Bible says, For we are laborers together with God. And just as the end, I want to include this because it's in the verse. The Bible goes on to say in verse 9, Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Some men said, I'm of Paul. Some men said, I'm of Apollos. And God says, no, you're mine. You're mine. And we need to labor together that God can get the increase. We're saved. We're going to heaven. Don't forget there's a reward involved for individual labor. But if anything's ever going to change, if we're going to get people in our family saved, if we're going to get our co-workers saved, if we're going to get our, our dearest friend to come to the knowledge of the truth, God's only going to do that through one way. Planting and watering. What's your calling? You know what it is. Do it. And let's do it together. And let's let God reap the harvest. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you. Thank you, Lord for sending a planter and a waterer into our life. God, that you could get the increase of our soul. Lord, that you'd save us from sin, death, hell, and the grave. Thank you, Lord, for allowing a laborer to come and to minister to us the truth of the Word of God, that not only we be saved, but, Lord, that we could be sanctified and that we could be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you'd help us as a church, as Grace Baptist Church, help us, God, to be laborers together with you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to come down and pray,